Welcome to Barbara's Bookstore. Thank you for joining us this, for this evening's event. We are excited to bring you Fred Gutenberg, author of Find the Helpers. Tonight, Fred is hosted by Jesse Rogers and MLB Insider. Go for it, Jesse. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm, I'm very honored to be hosting this night. Thanks to Barbara's Bookstore and, of course, Fred's new book, Find the Helpers, which I've read a couple times now. I actually got away on vacation, Fred. And uh, with my mask as a, as a book holder, placeholder, was able to read this a couple times. It, it, it's such a wonderful book. And we're so glad people have, have joined us for this uh, book launch. Uh, thanks again to Barbara's Bookstore. And at the bottom, um, you can get your copy for 10% off if you click on the um, yeah. link there at the bottom of our screen. But we'll get to that in a little bit. It's my honor to first and foremost introduce Fred Gutenberg, the author of Find the Helpers. And I think a lot of people know your story, Fred, and your journey. But um, real quick, and we'll, we'll get into some background. I mean, writing this book had to be both cathartic, um, emotional, um, probably a few other adjectives to go along with that. But I'll let you describe what it meant to write, write this book. You, you just actually used the two words that I would use. Um, you know, I was never what I would call a writer before this happened. And when we were planning Jamie's funeral, um, the funeral director handed me a journal and said, I want you to use this. Just start writing your thoughts, writing about your day. And I said, I've never done that before. He goes, just trust me. He goes, you're going to want to do this now. And it's amazing to me to think that he did that. And I really do. I think of the people at the funeral home as helpers along my journey. Um, but his saying that to me got me to start writing about my day. And social media also became a platform for me to write, especially Twitter, where I really learned how to write very um, impactful, short messages um, about what was happening in my life. So writing became important to me. It was my way of getting things off my chest. It was my way of getting through my day. And a few months after Jamie was killed, I said to my wife, I want to write a book. I want to write our story. Um, writing this book was very cathartic for me. Um, telling my story and getting it off my chest um, helped me in really meaningful ways. But... It also, and you read the book, there were parts of this book that were terribly emotional for me where mm -hmm. I had to go through events again to write them. Um, and that was difficult. It was exhausting. But I want people to know my story. I want people to know how I went through some of the worst things you could go through possibly. And then I got through it. And then I'm able to move forward and and how um so writing this book telling my story but ultimately telling the stories of all these other people i would say in a weird way saved me oh it's wonderful and um you know we're gonna here's the beautiful thing about fred for people joining in fred is willing to talk about anything and write any and he's written about the most tragic moments of his life several of them. His brother died as a result of 9-11, uh, you know, having gone in there as a first responder, and then obviously what happened with your daughter. So later on, we will take questions for those of you, and there really is no question that's off limits. So there's that uh, ask a question uh, link at the bottom there, bottom right, you'll be able to um, line them up now as a matter of fact. Let's backtrack for people um, that don't know me very well. I, I work over at ESPN Chicago. I've been there a decade, and you know, our connection's kind of interesting. Anthony Rizzo, everybody knows Anthony Rizzo that's watching, first baseman for the Cubs. He went to Stoneman Douglas High School yeah. years before, obviously, the tragic shooting. And not only is there a connection there, but Anthony Rizzo's agent, who I know very well, Mark Pollock, is Fred's cousin. Sure and is. so that is the connection. Um, and, and again, very honored that, that you asked me to, to host this, but I know that you're you're actually looking forward to talking a little sports in the sense that sports 
was a helper for you and continues to be. And we've we've seen this throughout the summer with the social injustice. Sports can be a driver for change, for good. Yeah. Um, and I, I know you probably want to talk about your Dolphins and your Florida Panthers, Fred's in Florida. But maybe we'll start there. Uh, you find the helpers. You found them in, 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 in sports teams and, and people that work for them. Well, I did, my family did, and the other families did. And, you know, and I'm glad you we're starting there because most people know me and my political um, work. <laughs> we'll call it that. And um, But the sports world has meant so much to me. Um, I'll start with Anthony. Uh, you know, Anthony is what I would now call a Chicago icon. But he's also, he and his family are friends of ours. And through my cousin, um, you know, Anthony watched my children grow up. Anthony mm -hmm. knew my daughter. Um, when, when my daughter died, um, Anthony's family, and that included Anthony fairly short order after, they were at my house that whole week. Um, you know, it, it was, it was, unbelievable to see Anthony's parents. I mean, they were whatever we needed. Got to get food in the house. They were doing it. You would need us to clean the kitchen. You'd want us to take out the garbage. You want us just to make sure we're there. No, you know, noticing who's going in, who's going in, whatever we needed, just helping my family. Um, and because that's who they are, you know, people, Anthony's this great baseball player. But he's also this guy with this massive, huge heart, maybe because of what he's gone through. I think most people who know his story know of his medical issues with cancer. And, and what they may not know is the work he does to help others with cancer, especially children, and the amount of money he works day in and day out to raise for others, you know, and again, mainly kids with cancer, because he's this guy with this big heart. Just a really great guy. And his support of my family and his family support of my family, um, they are people who I would count as my helpers. Um, but, you know, then there's the sports teams. Um, there's my Florida Panthers. And I am a monster Panthers fan. My son plays ice hockey, uh, played for the Stoneman Douglas hockey team. To say the hockey community wrapped their arms around my family would be an understatement. That they wrapped their arms around our community would be an understatement. When the Stoneman Douglas team miraculously after February 14th mm -hmm. went on to win these championship games and went to the national championship games, the Florida Panthers stepped up, provided the team playing, made a donation to make sure there was going to be no cost required. They brought the Stanley Cup to the arena for the kids to actually skate around with, um, just as a healing effort. But they also had these nights commemorating the 17 families. They raised money for the families. There's now a permanent memorial in the Florida Panthers building for those who were lost. Um, really beyond, over and beyond. The Miami Heat, you know, there were a couple of kids amongst the 17 who were very into basketball. And the Miami Heat really stepped up in support of those families and, again, our community. And the Dolphins did the same thing. Um, it was just, I mean, the, the, the Miami Marlins, in fact, Anthony was at the game. It, I think it was, it may have been the opening game of the year. I yeah. can't remember. But it was. I, I was there. It was the opening night. We happened to go back to Miami for opening night. Yeah. And amazing. So they brought all the families there. Actually, it was an invitation to the community. And yeah. my son, my son is the one who threw out the, the pitch to Anthony. So um, every which way sports could have helped to lift the spirits of people, of the community, of my family, they were there to do it. And it's so important that you ask me this and I have a chance to talk about it because when I talk about find the helpers, sometimes, and I talk about it sometimes being in unexpected places, 
you know, I would call a lot of what happened unexpected, but our helpers, that's who they are. And I think um, I've had the good fortune of, of just experiencing the, the love of so many people, but yet look around our country. These are the kinds of things these teams and players do all the time for people in need. They're doing it now through COVID. They've done it through other tragedies. Um, and I consider myself very fortunate to have been a part of that and their love. And actually, you have more nice things to say about politicians in this book than I thought. But my, <laughs> what I wanted to say was not always can politicians step up the way we all want, but professional athletes, other people of means can and have. Bradley Whitford, the actor, wrote the forward to this to yeah. this wonderful book. So where you can't always rely on the politicians because there's politics involved, you can rely sometimes on other people. And, you know, I was at spring training the day of the shooting, Valentine's Day 18, and Anthony Rizzo had only been there a few days. And yeah. he immediately flew down there and, you know, obviously connected with the school and spoke and, and, and was with your family. And then again, we returned in uh, what was late March, early April for opening night. So I can see how that that connection, you know, was important to you and continues to be. And we, we see it again, school shootings, racial, social injustice, sports teams can have a say. Uh, a guy I work with, Theo Epstein, who just, you know, stepped down from his position with the Cubs. Why? In part, he wants to work in, in, in community service because he sees what the uh, what a difference you can make as a celebrity or as an athlete or as someone of, of, of means. Listen, and, and it, it, you know, I was in Chicago um, two summers ago, um, and Anthony introduced me to Theo in person. And Theo is a really unique guy who cares deeply yes. about the communities around him and what's happening in the world. And, and, you know, here he is, this person running this Chicago Cubs sports program. And in fact, it was the year, I think it might've been the year after the World Series, maybe it was two years after, that he was a part of building. And he wanted to talk to me, not about any of that, but how he could help me in the world of gun violence. Yeah. What could he do to be a part of that? Um, you know, because as I tell people all the time, we may look out in the world and see, big time athletes or big time entertainers or big time politicians. But the truth is at the end of the day, we're all just human beings with hearts and families we love and people we want to help. And, um, you know, I, I think um, we would be well served by understanding the goodness that exists in everybody and being open to receiving it. Fred, I want to read one paragraph from your book. And of course sure. you can purchase it. 10% uh, off if you use the code event. Look at the uh, your screen bottom right there. You'll see the uh, the event code right there. But this is this is early on. This is page 26. The introduction on a day of love is the is the chapter or the name of the introduction introductory pair, uh, chapter here. I just want to read this one paragraph. And you know when we talked about doing this, you mentioned the book isn't overly political. It's about finding your helpers. But I think this paragraph sums it up. It starts a little political, but, but which is okay. But then it, it goes to the essence of it all. So I want to read this to everybody. My personal mission is to break the gun lobby. My goal for the rest of my life is to help elect every government official who supports gun safety laws and to campaign against anyone who doesn't. But I have a separate mission for this book. To fight, you have to have hope. And this book is about nourishing the soul so that you have the stamina to fight. This book is meant to be a beacon of love and hope and compassion. Combined with my advocacy, my hope is that it will finally shift an immovable object. And I mean, that paragraph really is beautiful, beautifully written and, and, and sums up the essence of the book. Yes, there's political activism within this book, but it is about hope and getting help during times of grief and then getting help to activate the activism, so to speak. And Boy, you've had a lot of help. And now I'll say something nice about politicians, starting with our president-elect. You have a nice connection with him well before he was president-elect. Yeah. Um, I know you're hoping that he can take things to another level here. 
Listen, in every um, facet of life, whether it's politics, sports, anywhere else, there's bad people, right? We all we all know that. But just because there's bad people doesn't mean they're all bad. The same is true in politics. And the truth is. I've met some really amazing people in the world of politics who are committed to doing good, who want to do the right thing. And one of the people who I've gotten to know uh, is the president-elect Joe Biden. Um, He reached out to me about 10 days after Jamie was murdered. Uh, He wasn't running for anything at the time. Really what he was trying to do was support his son, Bill Biden's foundation and it was funny the way he reached out to me is he called me and i was not answering phone calls uh, at the time if, if i didn't recognize your number sure so he left a message where he said uh, you're probably not picking up the phone which i understand but this is joe biden and i will be calling you back at i think it was six o'clock at exactly six o'clock if you want to speak to me pick up the phone if not i do understand I, I mean, just totally like the unbelievable way of putting it. And yeah. of course, when I heard that, I picked up the phone when he called sure. back. And we spent, I would say, 40, 45 minutes on the phone. He wanted to know about my daughter. That's her um, behind me. Um, about my son, about my wife. And yes, about me as well. He wanted to talk to me about his family and what they've gone through and how they've gotten through it. And by the end of the call, what he really wanted to know was what my plan was. Um, And I told him I want to break the effing gun lobby. (laughs) That led to a discussion of what he called mission and purpose, um, which has really formed the foundation of what I do. At the end of the call, he invited me to um, an event that he was going to be doing in Florida a few weeks later. And he asked me to bring one of the other Parkland parents. When we got there, Uh, There were like 250, 300 people there waiting to hear him speak. He gets there. He's shaking a lot of hands. And eventually he has his aide bring us to a private room, which I figured we were going to be in for two minutes. You know, he's got hundreds of people waiting to hear him speak. And we get into this private room. He sits us down. And about 20 minutes into that conversation, I said to him, I said, you have hundreds of people waiting to hear you speak. Don't you need to go? And he just said, this is more important because that's who he is. This yeah. decent, empathetic, caring person. And what blew me away in that conversation is the time he took to speak to us and why he wouldn't leave us until he did about our families and how we're, we all grieve differently and how because of that, many families fall apart after an event like this. And he didn't want that to happen to us. So he wanted us to know this and to have a plan on how to deal with it. This is a person who cares nothing about nothing more than helping those that he can. He's got decency in his heart. He's empathetic. And at a time where this country needs an empathetic president, there cannot be a better choice. You know, I remember one thing Anthony Rizzo said when he when he returned from being down there and, you know, the media was all around him because this was a national story. And, you know, Anthony Rizzo is no politician, right? He's a baseball player. He's he's he was 28 years old at the time. He hasn't seen. (laughs) Yeah, he hasn't seen the life's experiences like like you and I have Um, you a little bit more than me (laughs) Uh, age wise. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but the thing he said, the two words that we don't hear often enough, he used the words, why can't we just use common sense? And I feel like you, you, you felt that as well in the yeah. aftermath, common sense, but, but here's my point. It didn't feel like common sense was universally accepted, right? It, it, no. it, it, you, and so now you had to really step up your game, so to speak, if you're using a, an athlete's analogy. Um, it, I don't know what else to say, but, you know, have, making some scenes at the at the um, State of the Union, at, at Brett Kavanaugh's hearings, you, you, you 
you you made a point of standing when talking to politicians. You wouldn't sit down. I feel like you had to do things to get your voice, make your voice heard. And I I wonder if that you felt like you were on an island at times doing that, but then you get the backing of people like uh, Nancy Pelosi or Ted yeah. Deutsch, your congressman down there, or Joe Biden. Is that how it felt? Like sometimes you felt very alone, but other times, you know, you had well, the backing. Well, 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 first things first, Anthony. Listen, um, he he is very um, perceptive because to me, the the outcome that I want is pure common sense you know the only thing that interferes with the common sense approaches to doing something about gun violence is politics and mm -hmm. and people who make money off of it but to fix it is really common sense there's nothing about it that that wouldn't be classified that way now going on to the other part of what you said of the examples you used the only thing that i did that was actually very intentional and was about me not wanting people to feel comfortable talking to me about what happened to my daughter was when I stood. Um, the, the, the reaction to gun violence, in my mind, was always way too temporary, way too short, way too polite, um, and way too comfortable. And I didn't want to make people comfortable. My daughter just got murdered. So I would stand everywhere I went and if, a, you know, what you need to know is when you go to the Hill, Capitol Hill, and you go meet with senators and congressmen, they all have these very comfortable rooms with couches and coffee tables. And when you want to go, they want to, when they meet with constituents, you all sit around there. Everybody gets comfortable and everybody's happy. Right. I didn't want to make people comfortable. So I stood and I would tell the senators and the congressmen, you're free to sit down or you can stand with me. Um and most of them chose to stand with me. There were some who chose to sit down. Uh, with regards to the Kavanaugh handshake and the State of the Union, um, the, those were not intentional moments. Those were the, the State of the Union was an emotional reaction. I lost it. Um, the Kavanaugh handshake, actually, I, I would say that was intentional. I I was there as an invited guest of um, uh, Senator Feinstein. And as they were breaking for lunch, I went to talk to the senators that, you know, I don't know if you're watching hearings, but they're all in like an oval um, yeah. or semi circle, I should say. And specifically Senator Blumenthal, who I've developed a nice rapport with, I went to say hello to him. We were talking as he's getting up to go to lunch. I turn around and there's Brett Kavanaugh three, four feet from me. So I walk those few steps, I put out my hand, and I simply said, hi, my name is Fred Guttenberg, father of Jamie Guttenberg, who was murdered in Parkland, Florida. Which, just so you know, the reason why I can say it verbatim, it is the exact words I use to introduce myself to every single person who I meet when I'm going to talk about it. Because I don't want to wait. I want you to know straight up, up front, I have no agenda but this. This is who I am. This is what I'm here for. So that's what I said to him. As soon as I got to the murdered in Florida part, he did that turn that we all saw. And um, Don McGahn, who works for the White House and a security guy, they immediately got up and they just went with him real fast. I didn't think much of it. I just figured, wow, what a jerk, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, you know, I guess he didn't care um, and unfortunate because he had this beautiful family of his that were there at the hearings that he introduced. And, you know, his family, any other family, it's it's an American story, could become victims of gun violence, too. And I wanted him to be aware of that. So he does this beeline. He turns. I figured, what a jerk. I'm going to lunch. It's over with. I literally get maybe halfway down the hallway in the Senate, my phone starts buzzing. Oh my God, what happened? Because I guess the, the uh, AP photographer got a picture of it and it went viral. And it was like, before I before I could get to a sandwich, it was blowing up all over the news. Um, so it was crazy. I got back from lunch um, and long story short, for those who haven't yet read the book, um, I ended up being temporarily removed from the room 
and interrogated. Um, eventually, I got to go back in. What's crazy about Kavanaugh, um, while it was just an attempt at a handshake, that's all it was that he messed up. As people will read about in the book, he actually lied about it under oath um, uh, later on. So, because after the hearings, these these um, candidates for the Supreme Court, before they're confirmed, they have to answer uh, written questions that come to them. They're still under oath. And so their answers are under oath. Um, and he was asked about it. And he said, had I known that was a Parkland parent, I would have shook in his hand, wished him condolences. I only wished I would have had the chance to do so after that. I was there for three days. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew it. And he knew it. And even Lindsey Graham, the next on day two, asked him about it, and he blew it off. So he lied about it under oath, but it doesn't matter. He still got um, proof of the Supreme Court, and now we need to live with him. All these stories in the book, amazing. Uh, you can get 10% um, off, find the helpers. Use the code event at the bottom right of the screen here. We're going to take some questions in a little bit. We're just flying by. We're almost halfway through. So if you want to line up some questions, um, just go into the box there, ask a question, and, and we'll, we'll get to it in the in the second half hour. Now, Fred, I know you've done a you know a bunch of these, and we're halfway through. And uh, you know the fact that you're willing to talk about anything, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't just simply ask about your daughter. Tell us about Jamie. What was special about her? I know it's difficult, but I think it's important to put, you know, faces and names and people to this to this cause that you've undertaken. No, I appreciate that. Um, like I said, that's actually um, an actual picture. My daughter was a competitive dancer, and in one of her routines, she had what he known as this flying leap. And a photographer caught the photo of uh, her competition. And when she was murdered, this photo just went viral. And an artist eventually did that off of the photo. But my daughter was this beautiful, amazing, competitive dancer. And what really, though, made me so proud to be her dad is her strength and everything she did, um, whether it was dancing, whether it was in her ability to stand up to bullies. She was this petite little kid. That's what you might, she was not a big girl, but when she saw people being bullied, she put herself in the middle of it. She hated watching bullies bully somebody. Um, and she wouldn't listen to her dad when her dad would try to explain to her that I was now worried about her safety because she was putting herself in front of bullies that were sometimes bigger than her. And I was worried she was going to get hurt. Um, and to give you an idea of her strength, um, I think she was in sixth grade at the time. She came home and she told us a story about being bull about somebody bullying somebody else and how mm -hmm. she got herself in the middle of it to make it stop. And she told me how big the person was. I said, you can't do that anymore. I said, if you see somebody being bullied, you need to get an adult. Um, and she just said to me, she was, Dad, you've always underestimated me because of my size. And, and I said, oh, so you think you're tough? And she said, yeah. So I pushed her. And she pushed me back. And I pushed her again. And she pushed me back again. The third time I pushed her, I got what became known as the kangaroo kick in my house. Because <laughs> my daughter had these fierce, fast dancers' legs. And what I learned in that moment is she doesn't play. You know, um, When she's done, she's done. When I collected myself, I just put my hand on her shoulder. I said, if anybody ever pushes you around again, that's what you do. Um, and it was over with. But my daughter, um, she did. She, she fought for kids who other kids would bully. She volunteered her time for kids with special needs. It was her dream to become a pediatric physical therapist for kids with special needs. Um, you know, she just had this amazingly clear head on her shoulders of who she was, what she wanted to do. 
um, at her funeral, I, I described her as the energy in the room. Uh, and she was, because it didn't matter if you were in my house or at the dance studio or in school. You were either laughing because of her or yelling because of her. You were always responding to her. She was just that kind of a person. Um, yeah, my house is a much quieter place. And um, I would, what I would do, because she loved to laugh, to hear her laughter one more time. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, what I'm what I'm happy about is we we still remember her name. We know your name from the activism. I for a moment was going to Google the shooter's name, and then I didn't do it. I don't nope. think anybody remembers the shooter's name, nor should they. But they remember your name because of what you've done, and certainly your daughter's name because of the, the, the stories you, you tell about her, which, which, which you just did. And a my, lot of that is no, my mission a, is to make sure nobody ever forgets yeah. who my daughter is. Yeah. That chapter about her is just quite, quite moving. And I hope people get a chance. Louisa writes that she just picked up a book. We appreciate that Louisa. Thank and, you. and anybody that wants to ask a question in the second half hour, <laughs> feel free to, to write it, uh, uh, in the in the question box there. Thanks to Barbara's Bookstore, of course, for hosting us. Um, I, last I talked to Barbara's, the, the actual store was open. Like you could go in there. But it, 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 I, I don't know what the situation is these days, but virtually you can still buy books um, yeah. and, and get, that, get, it, get it that way. <laughs> Listen, in this strange world of COVID that we find ourselves in, um, I believe they are open, but they do have the books and they're also able to take the orders online. Yeah. What I have also done, and I'll show you a photo, um, I sent them, these are our book plates. They're basically stickers that go in the book, and I sent them a bunch of signed ones. So anyone who gets the book will have a signed book. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I hope people do, because especially this, what we're going through now in these times of COVID, I mean, today we we surpassed 253,000 Americans who have died. Mm -hmm. And I want people to know while we're going through this, that we are going through this together. And I hope if they read my book, that they do understand that no matter what we go through in life, we do have a path forward. You know, my rabbi at Jamie's funeral said, we don't move on, we move forward. And this book, I write how I did that. And I hope people take it to heart because I can tell you with certainty, I didn't do it alone. I did it with amazing others, whether they were from my community, from the circle of friends and family that I had before this, or who have come from the circle of friends that I've developed since this. But you don't do it alone. And, and I hope people read the book and from this point forward, always stay aware of who their people are, who their helpers are, who their circle is. And if you're not sure, go to a place of worship, go to a community center, because there's always, always amazing others out there that just simply want to do nothing but help people in need. I also hope people who read this book come away from it feeling, you know what, when I'm in a position where I can be, where things are okay for me, I always need to be a helper to someone else who needs it. Um, so I hope people do go out and read the book because it is not a book about just, you know, what happened. This is a book about hope. It is a book of how I got to go forward. Um, it, it is is a book that I get to talk to kids in directly um, and our future, what I call our future heroes and leaders about how to go forward from moments in life, some that are worse than others. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm really honored that I get to do events like this and talk about the book. Um, and I, And I hope people after they've had a chance to read it, 
um, will hopefully reach out to me and share their thoughts. Um, so appreciate that. I want to, I want to talk about your activism as, as well and, and where it is right now. I'm sure. trying not to be too political, but obviously the president elect has been in your corner. I want to get your thoughts on where that, where it might go once he takes over. And obviously, um, you know, if you read the book, the outgoing president, um, may have ignited your activism. You say he politicized your daughter's death on, on the day of her, fun her funeral, correct? correct. Um, and, you know, brought up Russian collusion in the same tweet about the, about the shooting. And I know that that really activated you. The morning that I buried Jamie, um, he tweeted about the Parkland murder and he blamed it on the Russia investigation. And he said, in essence, that had the FBI been doing their job and not focused on the Russia investigation, the Parkland shooting would not have happened. So he politicized my daughter to try and make himself look good. And it infuriated me because my daughter's murder had nothing to do with the Russia investigation. There was an FBI failure, don't get me wrong, but it was a low level call center failure. It had nothing to do with him. And so for him to make it about him, on the day that I'm burying my daughter, um, really put me in a place where nothing he said after that would have the same kind of impact for me. However, um, after I read the tweet, I was infuriated and I started just kind of pacing around my house. My wife tried to get me to calm down and kind of going back to the way this conversation started. What helps me sometimes to get through things is to write. And so literally an hour before we left our house for the funeral, I started rewriting the ending of my eulogy to address this tweet because it was the only thing I knew to do. I had to write. Um, and so at the end of the eulogy, I delivered a response to the president in that tweet. And I told him he has no permission to bring my daughter's murder into the Russia investigation. However, he has my permission to join me in an effort to do something about gun violence. Um, unfortunately, he chose not to do that. And unfortunately, he's chose to politicize the issue of gun violence. While too many people across this country have continued to die every day because of it. Um, I cannot wait until we transition to President Biden. Tell me what you think can happen for your cause moving forward. Listen, um, I cause, think not your cause, our cause. No, it, you know, it's an American cause. 40,000 right. plus people a year are dying of gun violence right now. And, and it's going to get worse because during the pandemic, um, through a variety of ways, there was a gun surge unleashed across this country. And, you know, when you take guns and first-time gun owners and you combine that with economic insecurity and job losses and other things, um, it's going to raise the gun violence death rate, not lower it. So we need to take common sense steps to start lowering the gun violence death rate, whether it be with regards to background checks, not just on, on weapons, but on ammunition. Um, whether it is with regard to the age of who can purchase, um, you know, banning high capacity magazines. I personally think we should be banning assault weapons. Um, as a country, we need to treat gun violence as a public health issue. It is. So we need to give physicians and hospitals and doctor's offices the ability to talk to families about weapons. And if you have weapons in your home, what you should be doing to keep those in your home safe. Things like safe storage. Um, you know, we there's just, there's so many common sense things we can do. Um, in Florida, after Jamie was killed, we passed what we call in Florida red flag laws. Many states call them extreme risk protection orders, which give law enforcement the ability through a judge to remove weapons from someone who's deemed or... A, a threat um, themselves or someone else and, you know, puts in place um, protocols to ensure that, you know, all judicial rights 
are followed. You know, there's so much that can be done that won't infringe on anybody's rights to ownership, anybody's Second Amendment rights, if you're a legal, lawful gun owner, but that will save lives. And, you know, the idea that we don't do it is, is catastrophic. What I also believe is with this new administration, listen, you see a lot of states taking steps to address gun violence. You see a lot of cities taking steps to address gun violence. But you're only as safe as the city next to you or the state next to you. And so having a national plan for this will be good for everybody. Sounds like COVID as well. You're only as safe as uh, your next door neighbor. Or, or The politics you know, of COVID yeah. and the politics yeah. of gun violence are exactly the same. How much would you say percentage-wise you've you've been able to move the ball since since Jamie's death? Uh, have, you, have you gotten 10% of what you want done? Is it more than that? Is it less than that? So uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, on a local level, in many instances, We've been very successful. There are many states that have passed some really significant laws to deal with this. The problem is it has not moved on a national level. And it is it has, listen, gun safety measures have passed through the House, but they've, they basically hit a roadblock in the Senate. And without going through the Senate, it doesn't go anywhere else. So we've, we've really been limited on a national level. And until we address this on a national level, we're not going to really lower the, the gun violence death rate. We have to tackle this in, in, a, in a much bigger way. Um, and, I, and, I, and I know that's coming. We're, we're going to do that. I want to allow people to ask some questions. I, sure. I know there's, there's some, some viewers out there that have many thoughts on, on this. So if you have one, Bottom right corner, just type in your question. I'll go ahead and read the first one here. Uh, thank you so much for writing this book. Is this the first of many? And will you run for office, Fred? I'm sure you've been asked that often. Well, so I'll answer the first part of that question. Um, I, I Is this the first of many books? You know, I, I have a feeling I, I will write another one. I have some ideas for things that have become important to me that I would like to write about. I enjoy writing. Um, I really do. Um, so it is not um, impossible to think that I will do this again. Uh, as for office, I, I do not plan to run for office. I, I have found myself being very comfortable in a role of saying what I think, when I think it, how I think it, um, and not worrying about the politics of it or sanitizing it. Um, not worrying about, am I being too rough with people on Twitter? Will that come back to hurt me down the road? Right. I don't want to worry about those things. Right. I have to be me. I, I am a father of two kids um, fighting to make this country safer. That's who I am. That's what I want to do. I don't want to fundraise. I don't want to um, do anything other than, than that. And part of that, by the way, is the electoral process, because by hopefully delivering more decency and civility to our politics, we make the world a better place and a safer place. There's a good follow up to the to the running for office question. If President elect Biden asked you to sit on a committee. Would you consider that where you'd have a voice, yeah. but you're not beholden to the typical Sure. Political sure. BS. <laughs> a, a, absolutely. Um, I, I am indefinitely intending to have a role uh, on this topic going forward. So um, the answer is, is if, if asked, I absolutely will. You know, I want to go back to uh, politicians that helped you because we make fun of them, but we're, we're, we're trying not to. And there have been many that have. And not maybe not just politicians, even some of the other celebrities you met. Who has surprised you, whether it be with their kindness, with their, with anything, with their actions, if they, if they are politicians? Who has surprised you? Well, oh, I didn't know that person had that in them or was like that. What? Um, these are people you've never met before, and all of a sudden you're in this world. Yeah, you know, listen, um, 
I'll, I'll give you two political examples and then, um, you know, maybe an entertainment example, but political examples, one would be Ohio governor, John Kasich, who I was invited to Ohio to testify actually on red flag laws. And the day that I spent there, um, you know, I met with him for a private meeting and then I met with his, um, his administration. What was really interesting is I didn't really expect that he and I would have much of a connection politically. You know, we weren't the same, but we, I developed a real connection for him. I, um, he took the time to sit with me and just have a really deep conversation about what I was going through, about faith, um, about encouraging me to continue with my faith because I was in a pretty bad place with it. Um, and it was a very, really from the heart, meaningful conversation that went on for a very long time. What really also amazed me about him is when I was flying home, um, I landed and my wife said, you're never going to guess who called me. And I said, who? And it was John Kasich, um, who then took the time to call my wife that night. And my wife is not political. This isn't her world. Yeah. But he wanted to um, just check in with her also. And, um, and I just thought it was amazing that he took those steps. Listen, we're not a family that could vote for him. He did it because he's a good person. Um, the other person uh, from from the Democratic Party, another governor, um, was Phil Murphy uh, from New Jersey, mm -hmm. a person who I can never vote for. Um, we we had a mutual connection, and uh, within a week or two after Jamie's murder, he called me with his wife, and. Um, we spoke for quite some time and eventually, um, and he told me that because of what happened, he was going to make doing something about gun violence in New Jersey, a, a key issue for him. And he kept his word. In fact, not long after that, he was inviting me to New Jersey to meet with his team on what could be done. And ultimately back to New Jersey for a press conference where we were going to lay out what he intended to do. Um, he also has stayed in touch with us. Um, he, you know, he calls, he texts just to make sure we're okay. We can never vote for him, but, but he's just a good, decent person. Um, yeah. and, and I'm really thankful because while you will always hear politicians that politicians that it, these are just examples of what I've learned where, Many of them are just like us. They have big hearts. They have families they care about, and they're decent. There's people like Ted Deutsch and Eric Swalwell, who I, I count amongst my friends now because, you know, I've just developed such a connection to the two of them. In the world of entertainment, um, I, I have the good fortune of having become, you know, my friends with Alyssa Milano through all of this. And she's just a person who, if she could wrap her arms around everybody and make everybody feel better all at once, she would, because that's who she is. Um, her activism, her strength in her activism, the way she tackles tough issues without concern for what people might say about her um, has inspired me. Um, to some extent, has shown me the way. Right. And so, you know, when she reached out early on and, and then has maintained that relationship, it just blew me away because honestly, this, th these are all people who have lives filled with lots of other people and that they made time for me uh, mattered a lot and that they continue to do so just shows you how decent they are. Those are great stories. We have several more questions for Fred. We've got about 10 minutes left in our, in our, our discussion here. Fred, uh, thanks for writing this book. This is from Philip. It is inspiring and your points about finding helpers is absolutely correct. Who would you say has inspired you? Who has been your most inspired helper? You know, so 
I'll tell you uh, in two ways um, the answer to that. The person who's given me the advice that honestly has been more helpful to me than any other person mm -hmm. was Joe Biden. What he oh. said to me, and it was when he spoke to me about how we all grieve differently, and he talked to me about 92% of marriages falling apart after this and not wanting me to be in that statistic and actually talking to me about how to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, nobody else ever even used the concept with me of we all grieve differently. But it was the most important thing that I needed to hear because my wife and I are going through this differently. My son and I are going through this differently. They've been very private. I've been very public. I have been very out there while they don't want that. So we had to figure out ways to make that work. Um, and the, you know, knowing that this is not something that I have to be afraid of. We just need to have a plan amongst us came directly from Joe Biden. Um, and, and I just, it's been the most important thing for me to manage what I do while also making sure I take care of those I love. Um, the, the other person who helped me in such a deep way, but I don't know him. Um, but, but the truth is, um, uh, really important. Uh, when I was at my lowest moments, I used to get in my car by myself and put on my Billy Joel music. Mm. Now, I grew up on Billy Joel. Billy Joel has been with me through every phase of my life. Um, having that outlet to clear my head with something that just always worked for me got me through some of the worst days in my life. Um, I'm going to give you one more. Um, I have a group of a couple of guy friends that, especially in the early weeks, they held me up. Yeah. You know, they carried me. Um, there's the one who's the law enforcement officer who went back to the school and ended up identifying my daughter. Um, there is my other friend who did not leave my side. Um, you know, when we were planning the funeral, he stayed out of the room. So my wife and I have privacy, but he stayed close enough to listen to everything so that I wouldn't have to worry about anything. He had it all down for me. Um, you know, there are just people in your life who know you better than anyone. And these guys do. They carried me at a time when I could have fallen apart in any second. So it's so interesting because normally we rely on family, but family's going through everything you're going through. You, you, you do yeah. need friends. You do need friends from the outside to, to pick you up because you can't always rely on the family who's going through the same thing. My family and I, we were broken. Yeah. You know, we were broken. And, and so um, I, I am so thankful that I had the people in my life that I did and that I met the people who came into my life. I, you know, I think about my direct community, you know, Parkland. Um, and the people who I got to know because of what happened that day, who stepped up for my family and the other families, who, I mean, whatever any of our families needed, have I've made new amazing friends out of my community who I never knew before February 14th because of what happened and because they just stepped up for our community and for our families in such meaningful ways. And I, I, it, again, it gets to what I always say. We all have our helpers. We just have to be open enough to letting them in. Last couple minutes here with Fred. Um, actually, would a question, how, how, how is your wife and son doing? How are your wife and son doing? You know, um, and I'm glad you asked that. My son is, is doing, he's doing okay. Um, thank, 
fully. He's had this amazing network of friends who, from the second this started, they've had their arms wrapped around him. And, you know, he's growing up now. He actually just turned 20. Um, and he's got a really good life plan for himself. Um, you know, it was a struggle early on. You know, he always had that sibling with him. And the idea of being an only child um, broke him up pretty good for a while. Yeah. But, but he's he's doing he's doing okay. My wife, um, she is she's she's doing okay. Um, you know, I, I tell people all the time, we both lost our kid, but she also lost her way of life. Jamie, you know, whether it was with dance or whatever, I was always, you know, going off and doing with my son, hockey with my son. You know, right. we're both car nuts, you know. So I was always doing with him. She was always doing with Jamie. And so it's been for her um, not having her daughter around. And um, this has been really just tough. Um, but knock on wood, you know, um, she's definitely – she's doing okay. And um, together we're going to keep doing okay and keep doing better every single day. Of course, you you can you can she she's in the book she's in the book she what was yeah. it the one year anniversary she wrote a she wrote an would you call it an op ed well she did it was an op ed that is in the book talking about her remembrance of that day yeah but she's also in the book at the end um, while she's been very private she wanted to let people right. know her story and yeah. how she's not, while she's private, she's not absent. And so she actually wrote for the book. We have a forward written by Bradley Whitford. My wife wrote the afterward. Right. And to really tie up the book and how we're doing as a family and what she wants people to know, which is how to go get support and get help if you need it. Find the helpers. You can get 10% off if you click the link at the bottom of our screen. I want to thank Barbara's Bookstore for hosting us, Fred. That that hour went fast. Thank I know you've done many of these. You've had to talk about the most tragic, intimate moments of your life, and I, uh, you know, I can't I can't say enough about what you've done to move this cause forward and to help other people. I, I think of all the tragedies, Sandy Hook, Columbine, and I'm not sure there was a a parent who's who's done more and put himself out there more than you have. And this book, again, isn't about politics. There's politics in there, but it's about finding the help in, in, in tragedy. And you certainly sum, summarized in this book very well. Well, listen, Jesse, I truly appreciate you and this hour and um, your commitment to uh, um, some people who I care about a lot. Um, and uh, next time I'm in Chicago, um, I'd love to come sit down and be with you in person. Absolutely. And thanks for you know tuning in, listening, watching us today. Hope you and uh, enjoyed the hour conversation with Fred and, and make sure you pick up his book, Find the Helpers, available at Barbara's Bookstore online. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care.